And welcome back to Bible Talk. Uh, the first thing I want to do is just really thank everybody who took the time to visit the channel. Um, it really does mean a lot to me. Um, I greatly appreciate it. I hope that the information that you heard was thought provoking and maybe in some ways enlightening. Now, before we get into deeper subjects of study, um, what I would like to do is I would like to share some things for your consideration, hence the title of this video. So I do have some notes because I want to make sure that I kind of stay on track. I want this to kind of be like a, a short, quick little video to um, just to provoke thought before we get into some deeper subjects. And as I said before, um, it's OK when we get into these deeper subjects, if we disagree, that's why I'm going to post my notes in the description so that you can review at your leisure later on and, and check it out for yourself. I mean, I want you just to take my word for it. And, and that's why I'm trying to take my time and share and show you where I get the information from. So this way, you know uh, why I believe what I believe. So. With that having been said, um, I do have one question about the Bible. Get to that in a second. Here's the question. How do we know that Genghis Khan actually lived or Nero or Joan of Arc or maybe even Napoleon and others um, having never, ever seen their face? And it's because somebody took the time to write down information or that information was passed along, whether it's written form or whether word of mouth, so that those of us who live today would know the impact that these individuals had on the world. And it's the same thing with the Bible, if you think about it. I mean, it is historical in nature, a portion of it is. And it's sharing information with us regarding people who have impacted the world. And the primary person being Jesus Christ. Now, when you think about it, um, archaeology even backs it up. They've pulled um, uh, pottery, coins, um, remains of civilizations that are mentioned in the Bible. Um, even a lot of the countries or nations that are mentioned in the Bible still exist today. Or you might even read where it will say, you know, or if you do your research, it might say this is modern day Iraq or modern day Iran or something like that. So the Bible is historical. It's prophetic because it predicts and tells us what is yet to come. And it is like reading today's newspaper in a sense, because it speaks to what we currently see going on in the world today. And you can also look at it as um, a letter and some even say a love letter from our father because he he gives us instructions whereby to live so that we can all you know, live peaceable, happy lives, so to speak, and, and enter into relationship with him. And it also is, is, is warnings from him because of what is yet to come, including his wrath, so that we could be better prepared. So some might, might say, or the question could be, can I trust the Bible? And the answer is yes, without going into great detail and stuff like that. The answer is yes. And so I'm going to go to the Bible and let's look at a verse. And so what I want to do is I want us to go to um, 2 Timothy, the third chapter. Second Timothy 3, and we're going to go to the 16th verse. So I really wanted us to, you know, see the 16th and the 7th, read the 16th and 17th verse. And so what it says, it tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
Now, of course, if we hover over this word inspiration, again, I'm using the, the um, BibleSoft OneTouch or PC Study Bible with the King, I'm sorry, with the King, uh, Strong's Concordance Numbers. So the word inspiration has here divinely breathed in. So God divinely breathed in or inspired men to write these things down for our, our good. Now, what is written in the word, I mean, again, it says it's profitable for doctrine. If we hover over doctrine, I mean, it just talks about for teaching or instruction. And we are instructed by the word of God on how to conduct and live our life and how to manage through certain circumstances or situations. It's for reproof. Now, here's the thing, reproof says <laughs> conviction, evidence. But that word conviction really stands out because as we read the word, I can guarantee you every last one of us at some point will be convicted when we realize that we are not completely in line with what the will of the Father is or how, on, on how we conduct ourselves. It's for correction. And it just says a straightening up again, rectification. So basically correction is correction, instruction in righteousness. Now in the 17th verse, it says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So newsflash, I will say this probably twice. Christians are not perfect. Now we strive for perfection, but we're not perfect in the sense that the English language, um, the way we use it in English, well, most of the time when we hear the word. Now the word perfect in the Greek, and if you look the word up in a dictionary and you read all of the definition, you'll you'll eventually get to this particular definition. But um, if we hover over this word right now, it just says complete, complete. And what we're talking about is a maturity level. We're talking about growth, maturity. So we grow in our knowledge of God. We grow in our love, you know, we, or we reach a higher maturity level in our faith. It's a growth process. So we are all in process right now. And being in process right now, we're, I mean, with that having been said, we're actually all at different stages of the process. And so I kind of want to point that out. Now, to prove that out, I mean, I want to go to another verse. Let me close this out. And the next verse that I want to go to, um, I want to share with you guys for your consideration is Matthew, the fifth chapter and the 48th verse. So if we go to Matthew 5, 48, and it's only one verse, and it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, if we were to hover over perfect here, we get a deeper um, definition here. And it says complete. So we already know it's, we're talking about complete. Um, it says in various applications of labor, growth, mental and moral character. So completeness. So, so again, the word perfect doesn't mean that we don't, we never do anything wrong. That's not what that's saying. Um, again, it, it's just being, it's just a level of maturity and, and, and we're, we're striving for completeness. And so like, if I was to give us like an example, the be ye perfect, your father in heaven is perfect, or an analogy, if you will. So let's just say you have a farmer, he has a plow, and he has a donkey, and he wants that donkey to pull that plow. So to encourage the donkey to move forward and pull the plow, he may dangle, have a stick that's tied to his back with a carrot dangling on the end. And so as the donkey tries to start, try to get to that carrot that's dangling in front of him, he, he's in motion, and the farmer's holding the plow and helping to guide it so that it can furrow the ground and make the straight lines in which to plant the seed. Well, it's the same thing with us. I mean, we're the donkey, 
the word of God and as and Christ being that example to set before us, I mean, that's the perfection that we're striving for. And God is the farmer and he's holding the plow. So he actually is helping us to furrow the ground, to to um, walk that straight line, if you will, because we can't do it on our own. But we strive to be perfect. And there is a there is a misconception that um, if you say that I believe in the Lord or I love the Lord or I'm a Christian, you know, that you're implying that you're perfect, meaning that you never do anything wrong and your life is always perfect. Nothing bad ever happens. You're never sad. That's that's not the case. That is not the case. So anyway. There you go with perfect again for your consideration. Now, um, the, as far as the reaching the fullness of completeness or that reaching that maturity level, we'll never reach the fullness of completeness until Christ returns and we see him as he is. And that is actually in another verse that I will share with you for your consideration. And that is First John, the third chapter. And we want to go to the second verse. It's really the second and the third verse that we'll read. And what it says is, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he or as Christ is pure. And um, when you hover over pure, I mean, it's nothing more than cleansing oneself, setting oneself aside. And um, so I guess what I want to share with you guys is that you don't have to get right or be perfect before accepting God's terms of salvation through Christ um, that gift has always been available throughout all the ages unto this very day for all to receive. And that, again, and, and that is a choice. OK, so here's the next thing for consideration. Again, just a few things for consideration. Sin is sin. You know, like in God's eyes, sin is sin, basically. And so, you know, we have this tendency to stand in judgment of each other, categorizing sin as if my sin isn't as bad as that sin. Right? But if we read the word, and I'm going to take us to Romans now, because none of us, again, we just mentioned are not perfect. And so if we go to Romans And I want to go to the third chapter in the 22nd verse. And I'll probably just read like the first three verses. And what it says is, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And so, you know, we have all, we are sinners saved by grace. And again, because um, we do sin, and I'm going to share, I'm, I'm going to go back and, and pull up the word sin, but um, because we do fall short, even after coming to Christ, we do fall short as we strive for perfection. But notice here in the 25th chapter, verse, I'm sorry, it says, whom God has set to be a propitiation. This is who, Christ, we're talking about Christ. When we hover over that, Christ became he, the atoning victim, 
Okay. He became the atoning victim and it's through his blood, you know, that we are redeemed. He became our righteousness before the father. That's God's work in every man's life who believes and accepts his terms so that we can have relationship with him or have our relationship with him restored, basically. So Christ became the atoning victim. And so that blood remits, or it says here, um, we'll talk about toleration or remission of sin, but his blood cleanses us of, of our unrighteousness. And that's God's patience or his forbearance with us, because today I may accept his terms and believe but somebody might take them a couple of more months maybe a couple of more years to get to that point now when we talk about sin what i what i want to do is um i think i'm just going to type in the word sin look up the word sin just in the new testament and we're going to get a whole bunch of hits here and let me see if it'll pull up for me over here Okay, now, hamartia is the Greek word, but it comes from another root word right here, and I'm gonna double click on that so you can see it. It says here, properly to miss the mark. So just imagine an archer aiming an arrow at a bullseye, a target right ahead of him. You're either gonna hit the bullseye or you're gonna miss the mark to the left, to the right, above, below. You might even miss the target altogether. So when we sin, we miss the mark. And the mark is the instruction that the Lord set before us where or provided to us whereby we should live or do a certain thing, right? And so sometimes we do fall short and miss the mark. Now, some might say, well, when it comes to sin, <laughs> I only fall short in this one area or this one thing, we'll say. So guess what? If you break one law, you are a law breaker. And so if we go to, again, I'm, I'm just for your consideration, um, let's go to the book of James. Okay, we're going to go to James. I don't know why I typed it all the way. I don't have to do that. But the second chapter, and we'll start with the 10th verse. I think we'll just do the first three um, verses there. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye and do so as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that have showed no mercy and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Now, in this example, what I'm going to do, because I've shared with you guys tools and I so, you know, at minimum, King James Version, Strong's Concordance, so that you can reference words back to the Hebrew or Greek. But I also mentioned the Amplified Bible. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to read the same verses, but with the Amplified Version. And it's here on the right hand side. For whosoever keeps the law as a whole, but stumbles and offends in one single instance, has become guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not kill. If you do not commit adultery, but do kill, you have become guilty of transgressing the whole law. So speak and so act as people should, who are to be judged under the law of liberty, the moral instruction given by Christ, especially about love. For to him who has shown no mercy, the judgment will be merciless. But mercy, full of glad confidence, exalts victoriously over judgment. So you can kind of see um, uh, the difference between the two versions. And, and like I said, for those who may struggle with 
Um, the King James Version, the Amplified Version is the one of the better versions that you can use for readability and clarity. Now, on this matter of sin, again, for your consideration, then I'll continue. Um, the sin comes in when selfishness, I'm sorry, when selfish choices that we make to gratify our bodily cravings negatively impact the lives of others, especially the ones closest to us. But who did we really sin against? We really sin against the Lord. And so... Um, David said it best. David most definitely said it best. So I want to take us to Psalms. Uh, let me close this out. Okay, so we're going to go to Psalms 51. Now, I probably should start at verse 1, but I'll just go to 4. And I'll just give you the backstory. So we sometimes when we read the Bible, we think that everybody in the Bible was perfect, you know, good and never did anything wrong. David, King David, he was, as it's written, it says a man after God's own heart. Now, when we read it, some may think that, you know, like like God really loved David with his heart. Right. A man after God's own heart. But I think it might be the opposite way. I think that David was a man who sought after God's own heart. So David was a man after God's own heart. He sought after. I think it really should mean that instead. But here it is. David was anointed, chosen and anointed to be king over the children of Israel by God himself. And he's, his heart was Pure. He did love the Lord. He wanted to do those things that were pleasing in his sight. And he was anointed. He did become king. But we as men have um, free will. All of us have free will. And so David, over time, his men are out fighting a battle. And he happens to see another man's wife, Bathsheba. And he has relations with her. And a child is conceived. And so in order to try to cover it up, he brings the husband home from the battle and wanted him to be able to go home. Hey, enjoy your wife while you're here. And he said, you know, he couldn't he would not do that while his brothers were out fighting the battle. He would not allow himself to enjoy that pleasure. So in order to cover it up, what David did, he gives orders to the husband to take back to the commander, which told the commander to put this man in the hottest part of the battle so that he would die. So the sin was great. This man committed adultery. He also murdered someone. And there was a lot. He paid many consequences as a result of these actions. And so when he wrote this portion, what we're about to read, I mean, I could go at the, um, probably should start at the, I'll start at um, verse, sorry, I'll start at verse one and read through this so you guys can hear how, his heart because he repented. And if God has something for you to do, you may fall short or miss the mark. You may sin, but in the end, you're going to accomplish what you would have. I mean, he would have for you to do. I mean, David repented and he ultimately accomplished what the Lord um, had for him to do. So it reads to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan, the prophet, came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned. And this is the reason why I brought us here. When we sin, we sin against the Lord himself. It is his laws, his commandments, his precepts, his instructions that we cast aside. So we sin against him. However, 
our choice to do so negatively impacts the lives of others. But anyway, so he goes on to say, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Because remember, there was consequences as a result of these acts that he did. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. And the Lord says that when we repent, I mean, he'll cast our our sins, our transgressions, what they some say into the sea of forgetfulness, as far as the east is from the west. And those two never, ever touch. But David goes on to say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou desirest not in, or sorry, thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. So when you get to that point where you are remorseful over your sin, where you detest and you hate the thought of even rehearsing it in your mind and it, and it, it, it humbles you, that's where we need to be, a broken and contrite heart. Anyway, for, again, that's for your consideration. I mean, we do need to examine what I would ask of each of us is let's take the time to do an honest evaluation of ourselves. Examine yourself, not against somebody else. Examine yourself against the word of God. Examine yourself against his expectations but we have to open the word and read it so that we can know what those are, so that we can hear his heart. Okay, so the next thing for your consideration is about the different religions that are out there in the world. Now, yes, there are many different religions out in the world. A lot of them are based on Christianity. And what I will say is this, is that um, in each religion, you have people that are true to the faith and you have people that are not true to the faith, right? And so um, I will be, and, and if you think about it, those that are true to the faith, they're seeking out the living God the only way they've been taught to. I will be hard pressed trying to turn from this, the way that I've been taught to seek out the living God's face through Christ and that sacrifice on the cross, accepting that atoning sacrifice so that the wrath of God when it's poured out will bypass me. But remember this or consider this is that God's plan is perfect. His plan of salvation, his redemptive work, he knows those that are his. Nobody's going to slip through the cracks. No one will be left behind. Okay. But I want to share with you Romans. We're going to go back to Romans. We're going to go to Romans, um, the second chapter. And I want to start at the 13th verse. And I'm just going to read um, about three, three verses. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, 
which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. So, and it goes on to say, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. And, and so this is why I, I don't make a big deal, right? I mean, about someone's foundation of faith because God's plan is perfect. And then also he looks at the very heart, the mind, the intentions of every person. He knows the very motives and intentions that drives a person to make the choices and to do the things that they do or why they made a decision that they made. So we should leave all judgment to the living God and father of us all. He is the judge. Okay. So again, all these things just for your consideration. And I got one last thing and I made a note here. One last thing for your consideration. And what I have here for you is this. Christianity is not a religion. It's a reality because it's all about Christ and him crucified for our sake, about Christ alone. It's a lifestyle. We are followers of Christ in and through whom the living God has made himself known. And so we're on this journey together and, you know, we're all in process. And so let's encourage one another and lift up one another um, while we're on this journey. And um, remember, we're not perfect. And with the Father's help, um, we will reach that level of completeness when he returns. So I hope that you found this information, um, again, enlightening, um, if anything, thought-provoking. And our next um, video or next lesson, I mean, we are going to get into a deeper subject of study. And this deeper subject of study will take us into, will lead into um, Genesis, the beginning of Genesis. Okay. So let me just close us out in prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, I truly thank you for this moment and this opportunity to come before you in prayer. I thank you for this opportunity to come before my brothers and to share your words with them. And I do pray, Father, that you will perfect the right heart and the right mind and the right spirit within each of us and that you will strengthen our hearts and that you will draw us closer into relationship with you and your son. Um, we thank you, Father, for all the wonderful things that you have done unto this very day. And I just really want to thank you, Father, just for some of the small things that we may take for granted, um, be it unintentionally or intentionally. I just want to thank you, Father, for every beat of, my, of our hearts. And I want to thank you, Father, for the, every blink of our eye and the ability to see the beauty of your creation or to hear the beauty of your creation. I want to thank you, Father, for the very breath that we are breathing at this very moment. You are the sustainer and keeper of our lives. You are and have been a hedge of protection, Father, keeping many of us under the shadow of your wing. I ask that you may glorify yourself in the lives of those who grieve today. That you will comfort their hearts, Lord. And even those who may yet grieve at the end of this message or at the end of the day, and that you will strengthen the hearts of those, Lord, who are crying out unto you. Please draw near, show yourself strong and mighty. We love you, Daddy. We thank you. We praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. So, hey, I hope you enjoyed uh, this video. And if you feel that any of the information is helpful, um, please feel free to share. I greatly appreciate this time with you. Kirk out.